live from our studio in New York City on a Friday. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. Investors hitting the pause button after a wild week. With an hour to go in the trading day, markets are hovering near the flat line. Another hot inflation report and dovish comments from Fed officials appear to be offsetting each other. And the producer price index, not the only data point we got today. Consumer sentiment and housing starts also out, painting a mixed picture of the economy. We're digging into the data and giving you the best ideas for your portfolio right now. Plus, major shakeups in the streaming universe and at and CEO John Stanky has had a front row seat. Hear what he has to say about the latest sports bundle and what it means for linear TV later in the show. So let's get you up to speed on the market action. All of that said, and right now, there's not much action, at least not on the index level, right? Uh, we're seeing a little bit of a downdraft here to end the week, but the Dow is down about 100 points. That's only about a quarter of 1%. The S&P down about the same. The NASDAQ is falling a bit more here, down about a half of 1%. You know, uh, Josh, we've been talking a lot about this big streak that we have seen, had been seeing, of wins for uh, the S&P 500, up 14 in the past 15 weeks. It looks like that it is probably going to make it um, down 15 of the past six, mm. or, or what is it now? 14 of the past 16 weeks that it's been up. I think you're right. I think I'm right. Yes. It's not like I talk about numbers for a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you noted, so kind of calmer today, but we yes. know it's been a roller coaster week for the market after a slew of hotter than expected inflation data, mudding the timeline for a Fed rate cut. So the bottom line, Julie Hyman, is that the January economic data, it keeps kind of coming in and surprising us and not necessarily in a good way. So this morning, it was a much firmer PPI mm -hmm. than we expected, right? Um, core jumped by 0.5%. We should mention housing starts, by the way, also plunged. Mm -hmm. And you can factor in, you know, weather variables obviously there, but worth, worth a headline to mention. And of course, on the inflation data, CPI, early in the week we were yes. here, broke that. That came in higher than, than we were thinking and, and rattled the markets that day. Um, and of course, that it's not just inflation data, retail sales, we noted, weaker than expected. Now, right now, as you noted, you look at the major in, in indexes right now, investors don't pe appear too concerned. I think they're still, they're still focused on corporate profits and Jay Powell, but it does bring up these kind of big questions for investors. When, when you look at these inflation prints and other economic data, how Jay Powell and the Fed, how are they seeing this data? And how does it kind of impact and influence um, their rate strategy going forward? Yeah, and um, there's a lot of confusion still that's out there. I mean, Mary Daly, the, the San Francisco Fed, saying today that the Fed can't wait for inflation to reach 2% to reach before cutting rates and that she doesn't agree that the last leg of the inflation fight will be the hardest, which has been sort of a little bit conventional wisdom yeah. um, among economists. And particularly, so you, you saw that today, by the way, when you got that higher than expected PPI print, I think that was what at least you know some economists were kind of saying, which is that they, they looked at PPI, they, they looked at CPI, and they said maybe getting back to that one to two percent is gonna be tougher than some people expected. Right, but she's, she's sort of, pushing back she's on that. saying that's not necessarily yeah. the case and we shouldn't wait until mm. we reach 2%. One thing I do wanna highlight here uh, that economists were talking about today is that if you look within PPI, the prices for fees on investment management rose. Portfolio and investment management fees were higher. Right. And apparently that is also a component that is important for PCE, which is the favored inflation gauge of the Fed. We're gonna get that next week. So just to highlight that, guess what, we're not done. We're gonna get yep. more data. And it might also be data that is not terribly friendly to this idea that we are getting disinflation in a straight and orderly line. You bring, up, you bring up a great point, which, and we have some smart folks on the show today. I was going to ask them that exact question, which is, you know, how do they look at PPI and CPI? What does that tell us about what's coming for PCE? Because as you note, that is what our policymakers are focused on. That's yes. what they, yep. Definitely. So we'll be watching that. We'll be looking for more Fed speak and more data. Well, let's talk more about this week's market moves and what it means for the Fed moving forward. Let's bring in Tom Hanlon, a U.S. Bank Wealth Management Senior Investment Strategist. Tom, thanks for being here. So we just outlined what we have seen this week. All of it has equaled a little bit of a dip on the weekly basis in the markets. But how do we come out of this week with any kind of a clear picture? What do we do from here? 
Yeah, Josh, Julie, great to see you both this afternoon. Thanks for having us on. You know, the market looks like it's going to end the week where it started. It's pretty, pretty, pretty close. So an event-filled week, but the market really is kind of uh, kind of finishing off flat, uh, flat for the week. But I think the real, you know, the real key this week has been watching uh, expectations recalibrate in terms of what are people expecting that the Fed may or may not do in 2024. We got through the fourth quarter of last year. You had expectations as high as seven rate cuts priced into the bond market. Now that that expectation is down to about three and a half, you squeezed out this sort of excess enthusiasm or optimism for the Fed and, and, and expectations for 2024. We think that's been leading to a lot of the volatility we've seen as we closed out 2023 and started 2024. We're now kind of almost back to where the market's caught up to the Fed, which sets up that key Fed meeting uh, coming up here in March. And, and as you look ahead to these Fed meetings, Tom, I mean, what is your what is your call? What, when do you think they start cutting in by how much? And how much does that sort of how much does that impact, Tom, where and how you want to put money to work? Yeah, so the, at the December meeting, the Fed kind of moved the dots from, from two to three, and the market tried to kind of run ahead of that quite a bit. We were most interested, interested to see kind of what that dot plot looks like coming out, out of the March meeting as the Fed changed their expectations for, for what 2024 looks like now that the market's kind of caught back up with it. You noted the hot CPI print, the hot PPI print. You know, that's likely to keep the Fed kind of where they are, at least through the first you know five months of the year, perhaps six months of the year. So that kind of pushes us into a, a higher for longer rate environment in the first half. Then the question is, is how does the consumer respond to that and how do smaller businesses respond to that since they're more tied to shorter term interest rates and shorter term bonds for financing? And, and also, I would ask how you respond to that as a strategist, right? How you respond to all of this? Um, you know, are you changing your view as to where stocks are going to go given some of this data that we've gotten recently or do you hold fast to the the strategy and, and stay the course you know across you know different uh, asset classes like stocks and bonds for, for for stock investors we've been broadly allocated really across the market cap large cap mid cap small cap obviously the the market is you know higher weighted toward those those secular growth tech companies that's where you've seen the strength of earnings and cash flows and visibility into those trends like AI and cybersecurity and cloud spend and that. So we've been cap weighted for, for, for investors, just recommending broad allocation. We do find areas of the bond market that are attractive. You know, one of the things that's happened this week is you've had a backup in bond yields. You know, that provides some some more interesting and, and attractive compensation for, for folks, especially sitting in cash looking to get invested. So taking advantage of bond yields where they are and where they've kind of risen to this week, those are kind of some of the areas of the market that we find interesting. And, and Tom, for, for the U.S. stock market, I'm just interested, as you look ahead to 2024, what are the big risks, Tom, you know, the red flags you see? Is it sentiment, valuation? Yeah, you know, in large cap tech space, you know, valuations run ahead, but that's because, you know, you've got to have more confidence in where the earnings have come through. So, you know, cloud AI, you know, the, the tech spend by, by companies remains strong, so it's not surprising to see resilience there. We've been waiting to see this more of a more durable broadening out in the market. And I think the first step in that was this recalibration of rate expectations. So they were more in line with where, where the Fed was. Now it's watching through this first quarter and first two quarters of the year again, just to see how would consumers respond to rates staying up here at a, at a five, five and a half percent clip. And again, just seeing how small companies you know, respond to that as well. So that we, we see those as maybe the the areas of the market that we're going to be on the, the lookout for is if rates do stay up here for the first call it five six months, how do how do smaller companies and consumers respond? Um, and then, sort of, how are you going to change your strategy given what they say, right? When it comes to equity specifically, yeah, you know, we're looking for opportunities to get more in, more interested in those those other sectors, right? So the, the cyclical sectors like industrials and materials. You know, now that we're kind of in a place where you know, the market and the Fed aren't so wide apart in expectations. If we get this sort of settling into the economy, if inflation continues its gradual path towards the Fed's target, if the Fed signals it's it's now prepared to start to cut interest rates and kind of come off a restrictive level, we think there's opportunity then to see the market broaden out, whether it's other sectors, whether it's re, you know, interest rate sec sensitive sectors like real estate or utilities or smaller companies. So those kind of the mileposts we're looking at to get more uh, more attractive in these, these, in these kind of non-growth areas of the market. And Tom, I'll get you here on this. As a strategist, Tom, I'm just curious how much your how much your clients are asking you about the election, Tom, and and what are you telling them? And, and you know, as a strategist, does it matter to you, Tom, who's in the White House, Republican or Democrat? 
Yeah, I appreciate the question, Josh. We actually have a, a paper on that that we put out late last year. You can find it uh, in, in, a, in a search or on our website. And we looked statistically back all the way to the post-war election period, so 1948 to, to, to date. And we just we find there's there's little statistical evidence of major market moves based on on the, the election outcomes. Obviously, in industries matter, and you know different places where perhaps executive order or or who controls the Senate in terms of uh, confirmation. But in general, it's the it's the economy, it's growth and inflation that seems to have a much stronger correlation with market performance than than expectations or or, or actual election results. All right, Tom, thank you so much for helping us kick off the program. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Josh. Thanks a lot, Julie. U.S. consumers raised their optimism about the economy in February to cap off what was a week that offered investors a complicated picture. For more on the outlook on the economy, let's now welcome in Gus Fauche, PNC chief economist. Gus, you are just the man I want to talk to today, Gus, because I'm trying to make sense of this economic data, and I, I know our viewers are as well. They're looking at it, Gus, and they see you know, PPI higher than expected, CPI higher than expected. You know, retail sales were weak, Gus. How do you make sense of this data? Should we be, should we getting worried about stagflation here, Gus? Uh, I don't think so. I think that the CPI and PPI numbers came in a little hot for January, but the trend has definitely been for a slowing. Uh, I think that we'll continue to see housing inflation in particular slow. Slower, uh, weaker rents make their way into the CPI numbers with a lag. So I'm expecting that to start to show up later this year. And then the consumer fundamentals continue to look very good. The job market is good. Wage growth is solid. Uh, inflation is slowing, and that gives consumers more real spending power. So I think the outlook is pretty solid for 2024. And in fact, we've moved away from a, a baseline recession forecast. Now we think the most likely outcome is a bit softer growth in 2024, but still solid. Uh, and that will allow the Fed to cut rates later this year. Gus, this is really interesting. So basically what you're saying is the data that we got this week doesn't really change the calculus, right, that we had sort of going into the week here for disinflation still continuing and the economy sort of puttering along. That, that's right. I don't want to read too much into one month's worth of data. If you look at data over the past three months, over the past six months, they point to slowing inflation, gains in consumer spending, and a very good labor market with a very low unemployment rate and good wage growth. And I don't think that overall story has changed. I think that when we get the data for February, it will show that inflation is continuing to slow and the consumers are continuing to do well. And Gus, this is a question for an economist like yourself, so I'm glad we have you. When we look at PPI and CPI, Gus, what does that potentially tell us what, about what PCE is going to say? Because that, of course, is, is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. That, that, that's right. I think that PCE tends to run a bit slower than CPI. That being said, if we had an increase in CPI for the month, I'd expect to see an acceleration in PCE inflation over the month. But again, I think the longer term trend is for lower inflation. If we look at the last six months of the core PCE, which is what the Fed is focused on, that's actually been slightly below their 2% objective when you annualize it. Uh, so maybe it ticks up a little bit in January, but I think by the time we get the February data in March, it will show that inflation is, is continuing to soften and that it looks like we'll hit that Fed 2% inflation objective sometime late in 2024. So if we're not hitting that objective until late in 2024, I mean, we did hear Mary Daly say today the Fed should not wait until we get there. They should start cutting before then. So what does your timeline look like? Uh, I would expect to see the Fed start, start to cut cutting the Fed funds rate sometime in May of this year, and then four 25 basis point rate cuts over the course of 2024. Uh, even when the Fed starts to cut, monetary policy will still be contractionary. It will still be weighing on economic growth, just not as much as it was previously. So I think the Fed can cut rates you know, in the late spring, early summer of this year, make monetary policy a bit less contractionary, and we should continue to see inflation slow through the end of this year. And Gus, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it sounds like you're in that soft landing camp, Gus, then for 2024. And if that's the case, what would be some of the downside risks to that call? 
Um, yeah, so we have moved over the past few months, we've moved from a weak recession to soft landing. Uh, you know, some of the risks I think are, are from the geopolitical situation. So uh, conflict in the Middle East, shipping problems there, that pushes inflation higher. That means that the Fed can't cut or the Fed actually needs to increase rates. Uh, so I think that that's certainly something to, to worry about. And then if the labor market actually remains too strong, we had very good job growth in January. If we see those numbers repeated, if wage growth uh, reaccelerates and the Fed is concerned about inflation, they may need to tighten more. And that increases the likelihood of a recession sometime down the line. And Gus, I'll get you out of here on this. Just one sector I want to get your take on would be uh, housing starts, Gus, because we got data on that today, too. They plunged by about 15 percent in January. And I understand, you know, Gus, there's weather variables there. But what is your outlook for the housing sector in 2024? If you look at the, the weakness that we saw in housing in January, it was primarily on the multifamily side. We've had a binge of multifamily building over the past couple of years. Uh, we're seeing rent grow slow. In some cases, we're seeing rents decline. So that's leading to a pullback in multifamily. I think single family still looks very good. We've undersupplied the single family housing market for 15 years. I think the structural demand is still there. And I would expect with lower mortgage rates that we'll see single family home building uh, stronger in 2024. Gus, thanks a lot. Good to see you and have a great weekend. Thank you very much. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, we're checking in on some of today's top trending tickers, including shares of NVIDIA getting some big price target boosts ahead of its earnings next week. Plus, the NBA All-Star Weekend kicks off today. Morning Brief anchor Brad Smith out in Indianapolis to catch up with the CEO of AT&T, John Stanky, about the future of sports streaming. That's coming up in the 4 p.m. hour. Plus, our new edition of, newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analyst insight to break down two stocks and help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned.
Checking in on a few trending tickers. Shares of NVIDIA, stop me if you've heard this before. They are <laughs> higher ahead of next week's earnings after a batch of price targets. Raises headlined by Loop Capital, initiating coverage on this one with a target price of $1,200. So NVIDIA is already a rocket ship, Julie, we know this. Some people might think, you know what, I've missed my shot. I can't get in. Not at Loop Capital. They initiate NVIDIA. They say it's a buy here. Price target is 1200 Different reasons they gave their clients. They said there's a big upside to street estimates, in their opinion. They said this AI story, still early innings, and customers are going to need more of what Jensen Wong is selling. Yeah, there were a lot of price target increases. Remember, NVIDIA reports, finally, we've all been waiting for this, after the close on Wednesday. One comment from Loop's note stood out to me in particular. They talk about the demand from the so-called hyperscalers, right? The Alphabets and Microsofts, the big tech companies of the world. They say, Loop says, that the hyperscalers were in the process of moving to 50 to 60% of their compute for GPU, which is the kind of chips that NVIDIA makes, from 10% today. And they say in parentheses, hint, this is a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. it would be a big increase if they were migrating from 10% GPUs today to 50 to 60% of their chips being this kind of an NVIDIA chip. So you can see why they are still seeing such a huge market opportunity for NVIDIA, if indeed they are correct. Yeah, and they did bring out uh, risks that they thought the clients should consider. One was not valuation, which mm. they say is still attractive. Yeah. We have heard that before. Yes, we have. They did, though, talk about competition, how NVIDIA is not going to be the only sort of gen AI mm. silicon provider um, in town. So then, you know, who is the busy, biggest risk? Is it AMD? Is it Intel? Or do you think it, the market's just going to be so big it doesn't need to be one winner. Well, and then yeah. we also get news today that the likes of SoftBank, so Bloomberg's reporting yes, that, that Masayoshi-san from mm -hmm. uh, SoftBank is putting $100 billion into some sort of chip rival. There are some others that are out there that are talking about doing something similar. So yeah. there's a lot of big firepower potentially Masa behind this stuff. on the move. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, moving on, uh, sticking in the chip sector, but talking about the chip equipment sector, applied materials shares, they are on the rise day after beating first quarter earnings estimates on the top and bottom lines. They issue, also issued some stronger than expected guidance for the second quarter. The shares up some 7%. Um, interesting here because this is not the same kind, it's not exactly the same story, right? You can't, you know, kind of put all of the chip mm -hmm. stuff together because here we're talking about chip making equipment for memory chips, not necessarily for GPUs and for um, the kind of AI chips here. So it's DRAM memory chip equipment revenues and also demand from China that apparently was fueling the numbers. See, I thought that that was really interesting to me because the China AMAT is restricted in, in what they can sell to China, because obviously we, we know Washington has export controls in place. They want to slow down China's chip am, am ambitions. But even still, China was called out in this earnings print, right? Um, I looked at uh, sales over there, doubled to $3 billion for AMAT, so accounted for about 45% of the company's total. Yeah, I did see a couple of cautious comments from some of the analysts talking about the valuation here. Yeah. That, you know, it's uh, kind of fully priced, the, the outlook for the company, but we'll... We'll see if yeah. They're, they're, to your them. point, they're, they're Mehdi Hosseini, oh, oh, who is a very smart tech analyst over at Susquehanna. That's the note he put mm -hmm. out. You know, he he's neutral because after the run it's had, and it's up about seventy five percent now in the past twelve months. He thinks that's just obviously looking a little rich to him. But he he is not the majority opinion. Most still have a buy on this one. Mm. Yeah. Moving on, finally from chips. To streaming, Paramount has reportedly held discussions with Comcast about a potential streaming deal. So this one's interesting, Louis. So Paramount Global has recently held talk with Comcast, talking about teaming up for a streaming deal. This is, by the way, according to uh, reporting at the Wall Street Journal, signing sources. And we, we don't know a lot here. We don't know the name, the structure. We don't know the price. And, of course, it's coming after Fox, Disney, and Warner Brothers we heard are, are joining up uh, efforts to kind of launch their own sports streaming service. But more interesting to see these kind of moves you're seeing in the space. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, as you say, there's very little detail in this particular report. Presumably it would involve something, Peacock, Paramount Plus, maybe, if it was happening. I mean, the backdrop for this, of course, is also the Paramount Global is potentially in play as being acquired itself, or even its parent company, National Amusements. There's been a lot of reports that Sherry Redstone, who controls that, is considering selling it and that is in talks with various parties. So does that occur concurrently with some kind of deal with Comcast? Is it, 
instead of, it's it's totally unclear. Like. I, for one, would like to fast forward to a year from now. Mm. Just tell me how many streaming services there are and who operates them. You know, there, there's a lot of... Yeah, there's a lot of talk. To, yes. At a very high level, you get it. It's like, all right, you're streamers, we band together, and if we come together, maybe we can actually create a profitable product. Yes, but to your But to your point, a lot of questions. Price, uh, just, the just, name. And, and right? speaking of profitable product, by the way, Roku, I just wanted to quickly mention today that that share, yeah. that stock is getting shellacked today yeah. after it came out with a forecast that uh, investors yeah, and yikes. analysts were not very impressed yeah. about, that they're looking for higher revenue from that Tanking company. in today's trade, yeah. for sure. We move on. Crypto getting an optimism boost as Bitcoin prices surge this week. Here with all the details is Yahoo Finance's very own Jared Blickley. Jared. That's right, Josh. I thought we'd do a quick update on the ETF and looking at all the flows into the spot Bitcoin ETFs and some of the converted ones. GBTC, that's Grayscale, that has actually experienced $6.9 billion worth of outflows this year, and that's counteracting a lot of inflows. In fact, without GBTC, there would have been inflows of $11, yeah, $11 billion. You take that out, it's not even quite $5 billion. But after GBTC, we've seen, we've seen the IBIT offering, that's uh, iShares through BlackRock, that has actually gained $5.2 billion. That's in the number one spot. Following that is Fidelity, $3.7 billion. And then you have ARK with about a billion, $1.2 billion. Trails off from there. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting to show the actual fund size as well. Now, as a reminder, the Grayscale offering, that came out years ago, in fact, 2013, recently converted to an ETF. So not surprisingly, it has the most assets at about $23 billion. And then you take a look at what's in second Second place, iShares has about 15, 16% of the volume, then the Fidelity offering just a little bit less than that, and it trails off pretty quickly. There was a huge marketing blitz. Uh, iShares BlackRock really uh, put a lot of dollars to work here because whoever gets these Bitcoin assets is going to have a huge lead in the years to come. So it's a pretty powerful race when you consider all the management fees. A lot of them have waived their management fees even, uh, at least for the first year or up to a certain billion dollars. So we'll see how that race continues. But now let's just take a look at the seven-day <clears throat> uh, price flows in terms of all this crypto. We have Bitcoin that's up about 8.5%, Ethereum up 11%. And now if you take a look at who's winning over the last week, it's actually Ethereum and then Shiba Inu and then Bitcoin Cash. But what's interesting here is that the big guys, Ethereum and Bitcoin, they're pretty much the leaders. Um, uh, when you saw the, the lead up years ago to those record prices, you would see Solana, uh, Cardano, those would be in the forefront, but uh, those are just kind of taking a backseat. So it's still about the majors here, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Let me just get a quick price check here, and we got Bitcoin, $51,816, guys. All right, and we'll see if we get an Ethereum uh, ETF at yes. some point as well. That's something that some investors have been looking forward to. Jared, thank you so much. Former President Donald Trump has been ordered to pay $350 million in damages in a civil business fraud trial. Our senior columnist Rick Newman joins us now. And this goes to what Trump, and not only Trump, but his family and the Trump organization represented financially, right? The, the sort of, it has to do with the gap between what they said was true and what was actually true, if I have that yeah, right. This Right. This case is a bit complicated. It is a civil case, not to be confused with the four criminal trials Trump is facing. And this was brought by uh, the New York State Attorney General Letitia James. Uh, and she seized on a lot of information that's been in the public domain for a while through the New York Times expose, through uh, testimony by Michael Cohen and others about how Trump inflated his assets in all kinds of different business filings. He did that when he applied for loans from Deutsche Bank and from other companies. Uh, and this, since this is a civil trial, there was not a jury, so it was a New York judge who decided in two parts. First, he did find that Trump was guilty of, um, you know, severely inflating the assets of uh, the, the value of certain assets. That was phase one. That happened uh, at the end of 2023. And then the thing that happened today is he assessed damages and he gave uh, the attorney general of New York almost everything she asked for. She asked for three hundred and seventy million dollars in damages. Uh, I think he allowed $354 million in damages. He also said Trump's license uh, to suspend, to uh, operate a business in New York will be suspended for three years. Uh, so Trump is on a losing streak here. This is a big blow to Trump. And 
Uh, Trump argued during this trial, he said, um, look, I, it's not like I ever defaulted on a loan. Uh, the bank got paid. It made money. Uh, nobody was hurt by whatever might have happened here. And the, the, the oddity here is that the New York law actually says um, there does not have to be any evidence that any got anybody got hurt uh, for there to be business fraud. You can still have to pay penalties for business fraud, even if nobody got hurt. And the reason that law is there, it's basically uh, to discourage businesses from cheating. Um, so that empowers the attorney general to bring a case like this, which is what she did, and Trump lost. This will get appealed. Um, so who knows if it's going to end up being as bad for Trump as it looks, but it's bad today. Well, and the, the judgment, the written judgment here is pretty striking and pretty forceful, uh, Rick. Uh, just quoting from the judgment and what the judge wrote here, their complete lack, their being the Trump family, their complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological. Um, you know, and he said defendants are incapable of admitting the error of their ways. Instead, they adopt a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil posture that the evidence belies. You know, we've talked before about Trump using these kinds of statements and these kinds of judgments to raise money. Is that what's going to happen again? And is he allowed to use that money for the legal fees? Yeah, a lot, go, lot going on here. So the way that the judge described Donald Trump, that certainly do, sounds like the Donald Trump we all know and love, doesn't it? I mean, Trump has said many times, never admit a mistake, never apologize. And uh, I guess that works well with some members of the Trump base than it does with um, a judge in a court of law. Um, so the, the amount of money we're talking about here is serious money, even for Trump. Uh, and let's remember, he also just had to deal with another judgment saying he has to pay Gene Carroll, the writer, $83 million. Um, so the, it, nobody knows exactly how much Trump uh, cash Trump can tap, um, but he's going to start facing some difficulty uh, paying, paying some of these bills. And yes, uh, he does. He Everything that happens in court, he says, look, they're prosecuting me. It's the Democrats on a witch hunt. It, it definitely has helped with his fundraising. Uh, and the rules are complicated on uh, on what Trump can do with fundraising. He can't just put it in his po personal pocket. Um, some of it goes to his presidential uh, committee. Other stuff goes to um, PACs and super PACs, and the rules are different for all those things. Some of that money Trump can use for legal fees, which he has been doing. Um, but, uh, you know, we're getting to the point where Trump has so much legal activity going on. I mean, you really have to think that this is going to start to affect uh, his ability to run a presidential campaign, for one thing, if not his his ability to pay all these fines and legal fees, I should add. Rick Newman, thank you for joining us today, buddy. Have a great weekend. You guys. You too. Walmart is set to report its fourth quarter results next week as Wall Street expects the retailer to grow its sales again, despite consumer spending losing steam. Here with the key themes to watch is Yahoo Finance's very own Brooke De Palma. Brooke. Good afternoon, Josh. Good afternoon, Julie. I mean, certainly another strong quarter expected from America's biggest retailer here. Revenue expected to come in at $170.6 billion in adjusted earnings per share, come, expected to come in at $1.65. Now, the street, yet again, is expecting another strong quarter of sales. Overall, U.S. same store sales are expected to jump 3.2%. But similar to what we're seeing across other earnings is that's not as high of a rate of growth as what we saw at the same time time period a year ago when we saw 8.8% year-over-year jump for U.S. same-source sales. But Walmart U.S. leading that business. There's a slight uptick in traffic, a slight uptick in ticket and e-commerce growth expected to show uh, to prove strong same-source sales here in the U.S. Bank of America keeping a close eye on grocery share gains and trade down to continue supporting Walmart store and online business. Telsey also keeping a close eye on, Telsey Advisory Group also keeping a close eye on those grocery share gains. And any shift that we're seeing back towards discretionary spending, margin expansion, also something the street's keeping a close eye on as well, really to understand how this is all playing out in this deflationary food environment that we're seeing. Yeah, and by the way, Walmart shares had a record today. Um, so obviously, we, and we've seen so many Lots stocks of sort of rise them. into their earnings reports. There's also um, the acquisition that Walmart is making. Potential. Of, potential acquisition of Vizio, the connected TV company, 
maybe we'll get some news, some confirmation of yeah. that. Yeah, a reported $2 billion potential acquisition there for the connected TV platform Vizio. And really, what they're looking to do here, many experts telling me, they want to be the next Amazon Prime. They want to compete with them. They want consumers' data here. And by potentially acquiring Vizio, that would allow them to get this insight into consumer data on their viewership, on how customers' behavior is, especially as they want to ramp up that Walmart Plus, plus business. But there's a lot of questions about this potential acquisition. First of all, the price point seems kind of high, according to some. And in addition to that, what does this mean for other retailers that sell Vizio TVs? You're thinking Costco, Best mm -hmm. Buy, Target. So where does that put Vizio then there? But really, Walmart has this track record with acquisitions. We saw them buy Jet.com. They discontinued that, but they learned a lot from it. In addition, we saw them buy Moose Jaw and Bonobos. They resold that. And so really, this is this trial and error sort of approach that we've seen Walmart take before, and so potentially this will happen again. Yeah. Mm. I mean, think how much how much Amazon knows about you, Brooke. What you like, what you don't. Quite I, I, I had to say, try not to about, about it. it. <laughs> I'm sure Walmart would like the same info. Exactly. Right? Okay. Thank you, Brooke. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Coming up, the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analyst insight to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance after this.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Weight loss drugs have taken Wall Street by storm. An insatiable demand for GLP-1s has fueled big profits for pharmaceutical giants and sparked concerns among food companies over changing consumer appetite. So what's the best way to play it now? I'm here with Matt Higgins, RSC Ventures co-founder and CEO. Thanks so much for being Thanks here. For having me. So let's get straight to your buy stock, and it's one that has already been a monster. We're talking about Eli Lilly here. Of course, we have seen it rocket over the last year. So let's get to your thesis as to why it's still a buy. First of all, you're looking at the continued growth potential for GLP-1s, in part um, based on some big estimates that we've been getting. Yeah, I mean, look, for some people, the reason I choose Lilly, some people might think the train has left the station. I don't even think the train has begun to get underway. 40% uh, of America labors under obesity. It's a huge problem. This has a potential and will be the largest drug in the history of the United States, of the world. Uh, $100 billion by 2030 is the estimate. Uh, I think it actually could be bigger because it's not factoring in what happens mm. when insurance providers start to cover it. Uh, I think it's going to become an issue of equity. You can't have obesity over index in uh, among a uh, poor population and then it's not covered so I think this actually underestimates the power of Eli Lilly interesting especially a good point on the coverage because I know that's been a concern for investors um, second point here is what Lila, Eli Lilly specifically has to offer within this category because they're out with a couple of drugs but more to come. Well, Eli Lilly's not resting on its laurels, mm -hmm. right? So the, the the holy grail now that everyone is chasing, and some people just hate needles. Yes. And so can you do it in a pill form? And here's a secondary problem. Uh, there's been some uh, studies that show that there is a loss of muscle mass when you take GLP-1 drugs. And so it's an ongoing issue. So if you can combine a pill form with something that attacks mm -hmm. muscle retention, that's going to open up a whole nother market. So Eli Lilly is kind of like an ETF, because not only do you get the pipeline of obesity drugs, they also have some exciting Alzheimer drugs on the, on the horizon. So so you don't need to win just in this category. And then one more point in this category is the rate of obesity that we see in the U.S. specifically. Yeah, I mean, th this drug is completely on trend. It's like the whole world uh, has awoken to longevity. Aging is no longer seen as inevitable. If you look at the early data from Eli Lilly, not only is it addressing obesity, it's addressing comorbid conditions in ways they don't even completely understand, cardiovascular improvement in ways they aren't only attributed to weight loss. So in a lot of ways, it, it is a wonder drug. So uh, Americans are getting more more focused on how do we tackle obesity. Mm -hmm. Obesity is something that can be reversed, and, and that's not going to change. At the same time, we always like to talk about risks that are associated with this. And I have to say, when you call it a wonder drug, sometimes if something sounds too good to be true, maybe it is. So you have to look at what are the potential risks here with some of these drugs. Of course, and I think that's why some people may have been slow to embrace it. One, they didn't take the drug, so they haven't seen the impact. Those who have are evangelical about it, mm -hmm. mostly. Uh, some of the risks are that we've seen it with FenFen. -fen. There's been wonder drugs before, and it turned out to be unsafe. This has been uh, studied vastly. There are some early reports, though, about issues with bowel blockage mm -hmm. and some other you know, secondary concerns. So, of course, you always wake up one day to an FDA alert, uh, and, and, and everything goes to hell. But uh, so far, it doesn't seem that way. Okay, so Eli Lilly, that's your goodbye. Let's talk about your goodbye, the one you don't like related to this theme, and that is PepsiCo, and this is a very different stock chart over the past year. So let's get first here to what we've seen from e GLP-1 users, which is sort of interesting here. Again, looking at some data from uh, J.P. Morgan. Yeah, so I do a lot in the consumer space. I have a lot of co companies that focus on sweets, and I am seeing it everywhere. There's mm. been a dramatic shift in behavior. If I was to go into ChatGPT and say, design me a holding company that is completely off-trend, the answer would be Pepsi. <laughs> uh, Frito-Lay is uh, about 50% of its revenue, you know, uh, Cheetos and, uh, and Dor Doritos and, uh, and all that. So the bottom line is there's a huge shift in consumer preferences that's not obvious but as GLP-1 drugs spread throughout the population, this is going to become a significant impact on Pepsi's bottom line. Yeah, and I mean, this was an interesting survey in particular by people who were using the GLP-1s and just what, you know, the projections for what they Look were not going to Look at these numbers. If you know yet. anybody who's on a GLP-1 drug, they tell you the last thing they want is chips. They, they want protein. Interesting. They want, yeah, they want health food. It's just what they're craving to eat, which is interesting here. Um, in the case of Pepsi, too, 
you know, they do have some sort, they've made some changes in the portfolio, right? Smaller sizes, for example, of their packaging. But you say they've been slower to pivot to help. Yeah, it's interesting. Options. I teach at Harvard Business School, direct to consumer. And this year we bought, uh, brought in a beverage called Olipop, right? There's another mm -hmm. one called Poppy, right? So they're all about probiotics and about, you know, gut health. And what you could tell from looking around the classroom, average age, probably 27, they're totally focused on drinking things that are good for them. Pepsi has tried, created their own, has not worked. So they have been slow to pivot. All you have to do is look at the tape. Uh, GLP-1, uh, Eli Lilly announced Monjero on May 22nd, uh, uh, 2022, uh, May 13th rather, the stock price has gone from 292 to 740. Pepsi that same day has gone from 620 to 617. It's flat. Right, yeah, so it's, as you say, the tape tells the tale. And then, speaking of the tape telling the tale, Pepsi recently came out with its numbers and the market was disappointed. Yeah, I think this, it's not it's not a coincidence that the same day that Manjaro is launched with Eli Lilly, and then you look at Pepsi, the stock is entirely flat to do, which is hard to do. The S&P has gone up 26% in the same time. So I think the canaries in the gold mine was the fact that there's a revenue decline. Wasn't entirely attributed to GLP-1 drugs. Right. I think it's the story below the story. But, but uh, Pepsi is going to have to make a hard pivot, or else in my view, it's going to be in trouble. All right, well, so that, I guess, is the upside risk to your bear case on Pepsi, that they make that pivot or and start to build up their healthier brand portfolio. So, so here's the upside case. I think like like a lot of big, you know, massive brands like Pepsi, first they try to invent it uh, in-house because everybody wants to be creative. And the reality, it's really hard to create the next TikTok brand when you're a stodgy mm. corporation and don't want to take risks. And what do they do? They realize we got to go on a shopping spree. So I would not be surprised to see Pepsi do a few things. Buy protein-based uh, chips, start scooping those mm. up, protein-based drinks, probiotic you know, they start rebranding themselves as a better for you holding company because they are just completely off trend and the only thing they could do is shop their way out of it. Interesting stuff. All right, and for disclosure for our viewers, you are long, uh, personally, Eli Lilly, and you're short. And I am short. very short. I am very uh, good month, goodbye on Pepsi. Okay, so <laughs> let's summarize then what you're telling people here. Basically, you say buy Eli Lilly based on the growth potential of their GLP-1 franchise, including the pipeline of new medications and the state of obesity in America. On the other side, you say stay away from Pepsi for its reliance on income from snack foods, slow pivot to healthier options, and recent revenue declines. There you have it. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate you appearing on Goodbye or Goodbye. Thank you for watching. And we'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern.
Oil prices on the rise after a rough start to 2024. Today, crude oil closing above $79 a barrel, while Brent finishing the day above $83 a barrel. Posting their fourth weekly gain out of the past five, Inez Ferre joins us now to explain what's going on. Inez, tell us. Yeah, Julie, we had sort of a rocky start when it comes to oil for 2024, but then you saw over the last couple of weeks, oil really holding up above those levels that you just uh, mentioned. Year to date, you have WTI that's up about 9%. Brent crude is up about 7%. Look, a lot of this has to do with those Middle East tensions that continue, the Strait of Hormuz uh, being at issue, the Suez Canal as well. So all of that is priced into these prices. You also have the U.S. that's refilling its SPR, its Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So that puts upward pressure, especially on WTI prices. And then you have the EIA earlier this week, which lowered its forecast for U.S. production. So those concerns about oversupply coming from the U.S., too much production, well, those have sort of eased over the last week. You do have the IE, IEA, which put out a uh, forecast about slowing demand, but the markets, eh, they kind of shrugged off uh, that report. One other note that traders are also looking at the drawdowns when it comes to gasoline inventories and when it comes to other fuels, because that tends to be bullish for oil prices as well. And yes, also have to get the latest take here on gasoline prices rising uh, 11 cents in the last week. Yeah, that's right. Right now you are looking at the triple A average, national average at 3.28 per gallon. So it's ticked up quite a bit over the last week. Also over the last month, it's up about 21 cents from a month ago, still 14 cents down from a year ago. But we have seen these gasoline prices rising steadily. A couple of reasons for this. Of course, some of it is seasonal because we are going into the spring season, but also you have refineries that have been offline. Some of them because of maintenance, one because of a power outage in Indiana, a large one in Indiana. So that has pushed prices upwards, especially when it comes to the Midwest. I spoke to one analyst that said, you can expect to continue to see prices going higher between 25 and 50 cents a gallon in March and in April. Very important because A, this is an election year and people are really paying attention to these gasoline prices. But the other factor is inflation. We've been talking a lot about inflation, especially this past week. If we continue to see these energy prices go higher, gasoline go higher, oil go higher, that does not bode well for inflation. For sure. Thank you, Inez. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ford is once again facing the threat of a strike at one of its plants here in the U.S. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's Praz Sumeranian. And Praz, we were talking off camera here. It does feel like this one's kind of, this story's flying under the radar a bit, but this is important. Yeah, around midday today, this sort of, yeah. this, this UAW put out a, a statement saying that they they're going to strike potentially next week at Kentucky Truck Plant, this big uh, super duty plant that makes a lot of money for Ford. It's, it's cited as the, one of the biggest reasons why people are are, are excited about Ford stock in, in particular. But, so Super Duty, highly profitable, yeah, right? Ford, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Ford Pro Division, which which kind of manages the Super Duty trucks, is highly profitable. So interesting timing here with that, because just yesterday, Jim Farley was at the Wolf Mobility Conference talking about how, you know, the, the relationship between the UAW and Ford has, has, been, has been damaged. Um, they need to rethink their factory footprint in light of the UAW strikes. And, and he cited the, the KTP, the Kentucky truck plant, as, as a reason why this strike was so damaging. And next, next day, we see the UAW saying local union uh, rules have not been sort of uh, followed. Uh, it's been five months and they need to get a new contract. So the next week they want to strike. But, but here's the thing. There's, I think, 19 other Ford plants that have, lo that have local UAW contracts that are not been signed, in addition to other big three plants. So they're pick, kind of picking Ford here, in particular, this one plant, very interesting timing. I mean, they've been, they were very strategic before when they were doing the strike. So I guess it's no surprise that they're trying to be strategic once again and pushing this. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much, I mean, Fane and Farley right now is kind of going to be the, the main, main event. Great personalities. Yeah. Yeah. We will stay on top of it. Thanks to you. Thanks, Pross. Still about five minutes to go until the closing bell on Wall Street. And we want to check in on another trending ticker. We're talking about Eli Lilly. It is getting a boost today on the back of a price target increase from Morgan Stanley. And the analyst hey, Terrence Flint and team there, Flynn and team there, excuse me, raising their price target on the pharmaceutical company to $950, $950 from $805. They maintained an overweight rating on the stock, also raising the question of whether Lilly could be the first trillion dollar pharma stock. 
Um, and, you know, Eli Lilly obviously has already had a huge run on the back of its demand for GLP-1s. Another bull we talked to earlier today was Matt Higgins and goodbye or goodbye. He likes Eli Lilly too. And it's interesting, the data that Morgan Stanley is citing here, they're looking at, uh, among other things, at um, survey data from a company called Numerator that just looks in the enormous changes in behavior amongst uh, households who are taking GLP-1s. You mentioned the run though, which has yes. been impressive. The stock has been on a tear. It hit a fresh record high in today's trade, by the way. It's jumped about 30% already in 2024. It's about 140% over the last 12 months. And by the way, we also heard this week, Bridgewater Associates actually boosted its stake in Eli Lilly per analysis of its 13F filing. So yeah. some big names still see opportunity. That, you know, this has been such an interesting trend in this market. And it's not just Eli Lilly. I'm thinking of NVIDIA, too. Yeah. In other words, these big dominant themes that have propelled these stocks to almost unthinkable, unthinkable gains in a relatively short period of time. A year is not a huge amount of time in the market. And yet there is still such bullishness around these names. Yeah. It's kind of incredible here because of this belief in these bigger sort of mega trends, if you will. Um, with it for these companies. I mentioned that study from Numerator that Morgan Stanley cites here. The, the headline on that is that if you look at monthly grocery spending among people who were taking GLP-1s, it just decreased by 6 to 9% compared with non-GLP-1 households. And they made some adjustments for factors like household um, size and income. But 6 to 9% is... Yeah. That's not nothing. I love that you mentioned NVIDIA and Eli Lilly, because mm. you're right, because besides AI, they, you really can't think of another area where there's right. been this boom of interest and excitement than weight loss drugs. Exactly. Yeah, too. All right, coming up, the final closing bell of the week. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street. Let us do a check of the markets here as we finish out the week. It looks like a down week for the major averages. So, you know, we were coming in with that big up streak, 14 of 15 weeks higher for the S&P 500. Now looks like it's going to be 14 of 16 weeks higher with this. I got the number right this time, Josh, <laughs> um, with the declines that we're seeing here. Uh, so the Dow off by 145 points, about four tenths of one percent. The S&P holding above 5,000 just by five points here, uh, off uh, about a half of one half a percent. And the Nasdaq down eight tenths of one percent, which lets you know that it is tech that is leading the decline today. Stocks losing steam heading into the close in the S&P 500 on the verge there of breaking below 5,000. And this is capping off a wild week for investors. Jared Blickery is here with the very latest. Jared. Well, I thank you. Uh, Julie, I like that you mentioned that we're coming out of, what is it, 14 out of 15 weeks that are up. That is an incredible percentage. In fact, from the October lows, and it's been about three and a half months now, we got so overextended that everybody's been looking for a pullback. And that would be logical, logical to conclude. And especially in light of the fact that seasonality favors the bears until early March right now. And you can calculate that any number of ways. But uh, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive and just chart real quickly what's going on. Uh, the Dow was almost about to finish the week in green territory, but it's now in the red. So the Dow, S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, they all lost those losing streaks. And let's take a look at the sector action. Here is how we close today. Materials, healthcare staples in the green, but communication wow. services down 1.5%. Let me put this on a five-day view because we're going to see here the mega cap sectors were the three worst and energy and materials coming on top, Julia. What's interesting is even with this sort of data that we got out this week that seemed to indicate maybe some questions about the narrative that disinflation is yes. really making progress, the S&P is only off about four tenths of one percent. Yeah. So this was definitely not. Yes, it was a decline. It was. It feels more like a stop of momentum yes. than sort of falling off a cliff. Certainly. That's great because what happens here when a market gets overbought, it needs to correct in either price and it can go down or time. Sometimes it can just consolidate for a period of mm. time and move higher. And when it goes sideways, and we're talking about an index specifically here, when it goes sideways, that's indicative of sector rotation. So this week we saw tech. We saw tech down 2.5%. That's that mega cap sector that has been surging for the last year. Energy, somebody from coming from behind. It's nice to see some of the uh, laggards pick up speed here. And then we have healthcare. Healthcare has been one of the best sectors this year. Also an outperformer this week, up 1.1%. So it doesn't mean that uh, just because the markets got overbought here a little bit ahead of themselves that they have to go down. It might just be sector rotation for another few weeks. Or we could still be waiting for that catalyst when we go down. But Julie, I thought, I, and Josh, I thought it would be interesting to look at the semiconductor space yeah. because that has been absolutely on fire. Super micro, okay, that is just an insane chart. That is Here's, an, I thought, Jared, you know, yeah. when you look at that chart, I thought there must have been a mistake at first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, you don't, well, yeah, I haven't seen anything like this since GameStop, and there are a number of interesting uh, conclusions to be reached there, except Supermicro at least has an AI, uh, you know, behemoth trend behind it. Uh, SMCI is only closing up the week 8.5%. Here is the five-day look. Um, if we did, if we talked about bear markets and individual stocks, uh, this might be in a bear market right now, and yet it is so overbought, it's still going to have to take time to work off its overbought status. It's just kind of one of those ridiculous market things that happens from time to time when too much money is chasing too few a ticker. Yeah, I mean, Arm is definitely in that category as well, right? What, what struck me about Arm, the run last week and then going into this week, and that was on that screen too, is that NVIDIA, when it came out with its blockbuster um, sales forecast mm -hmm. last yeah. spring, remember, it just blew everybody's minds. Its forecast was 60% above where the market had thought it would be. Yeah. Arms was 16% above where the market yeah. would be on the upper end, by the way, of that forecast. And yet ARM's reaction yeah, was chart, just nuts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So there's just this, like, you know, it's tough to throw around the words mania or bubble or hype, right? Yeah. But there's enthusiasm, shall we say, around this theme, to say the least. Yeah, and it's not like um, the price price action is unwarranted. We were just taking a look at that NVIDIA chart. NVIDIA co uh, consolidated for almost, what is that, six, seven months right there before break broke out. 
the price action looking at NVIDIA is not unrealistic. Supermicro is a different story, mm -hmm. but when we consider some of the stalwarts, here's NVIDIA, here's that consolidation I was talking about, finally broke to the upside. It had done nothing for about seven or eight months. Now you're seeing the result of that. Um, you compare this to Supermicro, I think these are two different stocks. Now, this, con this consolidated for a lot longer period of time, but the liftoff from there yeah. is just the uh, ridiculous part. Yes, ridiculous <laughs> the speed. That's the technical term, by the way, chart is <laughs> the yes. ridiculous part. Yes. <laughs> Jared, thank you, appreciate it. You Here to sort through the roller coaster ride of the market this week, let's get to Oppenheimer Chief Investment Strategist, John Stolfus. John, it is always great to have you on the show. And just help us make sense of this market, John. So, you know, we're walking through this earnings season. It's been solid, John, right, relative to the expectations. But then we also get this economic data, PPI, CPI, retail sales, not so great. Help us make sense of it, John, where you think the, the market is now and, and where you think it's headed. Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show, uh, Josh. Always great to be on Yahoo Finance. Uh, I've got to say this, when we, we look at it, you know, really, if we look at the earnings for the S&P 500 Q4, you've got uh, three or four sectors with double-digit earnings growth. They, uh, at least three of those are cyclicals, okay, and uh, technology, communication services, than consumer discretionary, and I think actually utilities is the only defensive of double-digit earnings growth. Then on the other hand, your negative earnings growth is coming from uh, materials, energy, and healthcare in that fourth quarter. And when you look at it, it, we would have to say the mixed bag in terms of inflation data hotter than expected, um, a reiteration in our view of the pushback that the Fed has been giving that uh, to the uh, to the market, particularly the trading community and those much more leveraged who've been trying to get the Fed to pivot, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, re looking to reduce rates, uh, what uh, five or six times initially starting in March. Our opinion has been for a long time when it comes to inflation, stickier than expected, Fed on target uh, in terms of moving towards its target. Uh, and with expectations, the Fed will likely not push the economy into a recession because it's being remarkably gentle, considering that it's already been through 11 hikes and five pauses uh, thus far in a cycle that began uh, in March of 22. So the kind of numbers that we're seeing today, especially as, as uh, a, a speaker before me uh, just said, with seasonality, volatility, and then a transitional time, when you're liable to get mixed reviews, so to speak, not uh, not surprising to us. And if anything, uh, we'll stick to our, our, our uh, guns here. John, it's Julie here. What's so fascinating to me is there are segments of this market right now, and you just heard us talking about some of them, notably in video or super micro or even in Eli Lilly, that feel like 2021, that feel like when cash was cheap, right? That there was a lot, that people were just like throwing their stimulus checks into the market. Um, and it feel, you know, certain parts of it feel like that right now. What do you think that's a function of? I think it's a function, uh, uh, Julie, of, of uh, we are now at higher levels than we've been th that I can recall in the last 40 years of, uh, uh, of individual investors being exposed to the equity market. And at a time when jobs are relatively plentiful, uh, even in a, in a Fed uh, a hike cycle that's been going on for uh, just about two years now, uh, and so there's a lot of money floating around, and there's huge capitulation uh, after uh, 2022 when uh, the Bears' uh, negative pitch book uh, essentially was proved to be unfounded uh, because uh, nothing with the exception really of the direction of the market, which went down that year, but a lot of the things they were looking for uh, increased unemployment, uh, plunging uh, earnings and revenue growth, and an economy. Uh, sliding into recession just didn't happen. And so you've got capitulation of the bears, the skeptics, and the nervous investors. And then I think a general feeling across the uh, marketplace universe, uh, uh, particularly with individual investors and, and institutions that serve individual investors, that uh, Social Security looks like problematic to the future, uh, both for uh, existing retirees people planning on near-term retirement, and those with a long distance they go, and where's the traditional phase, place that you find the better growth? Historically, it's inequities. 
And John, next week, um, sticking with NVIDIA, right? They're going to report next week. Last, the Magnificent Seven, John, to report results. What are your thoughts on big tech here, John? Do, do you stick with the Magnificent Seven? I think that you do stick with the uh, Magnificent uh, Seven here, particularly if, if you got in at an earlier date. Why take uh, uh, profits if it's outside of a retirement account uh, and, and face high taxes? Uh, on your holdings, uh, we would think uh, for those who haven't gotten in, you don't want to back up the truck here on, on the on, on the Magnificent Seven, but rather realize that the broadening of the rally here uh, across other sectors, growthier value sectors uh, uh, related to things like uh, uh, consumer discretionary, uh, uh, industrials, places that are likely to see some pickup in this election year, also, as the economy, we believe, will prove to be continually resilient, uh, if, if not robust, and we're not looking for robust. Resilient is what we want to go for. We just think there's opportunity. We did see the smalls and the mids get hit hard today. They got hit hard on Tuesday. Uh, that's still uh, inconclusive evidence that they're going to be uh, places to, uh, to rush towards. Uh, but with, uh, without a doubt, we have to say the experience says if indeed the Fed gets to pull this off without a recession and companies keep showing resilience in terms of growing uh, revenues and earnings, hey, this, this does look like a, a, a rally that has legs here, notwithstanding uh, the reality that stocks don't just grow to the sky or in a straight line, but you have to be willing to put up with uh, Good days and bad days, you know. Yeah, most definitely. And, and John, um, looking in the much shorter term, we're getting NVIDIA earnings next week. And I know you're a macro guy, but is NVIDIA now a macro mover for the market? Are we going to see the following day, as goes NVIDIA, so goes the rest of the market? Well, Julie, I, I, the firm does not let me uh, comment on individual stocks because I manage money uh, for the firm and they don't want me to be pitching my stocks. Uh, but I can say this, related to technology in those areas that are significantly exposed to near-term, intermediate, and longer-term uh, uh, AI, we have to say we think they're still in the sweet spot. Earnings are, are likely to show uh, continued improvement Occasional misses on a quarterly basis when uh, the analytical community gets too enthusiastic about them. But the overall trend looks like uh, this week will probably continue some positive numbers, uh, if not extraordinary. But you never know. You never know. John, thank you so much for joining the show. We always love having you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Same to you all. And coming up, we head to Indianapolis for the NBA All-Star Weekend. Brad Smith sitting down with AT&T CEO John Stanky, talk sports investments and the state of the consumer. That is on the other side of the break.
Welcome back. We're here in Indianapolis at NBA All-Star Weekend, and we've got a very special guest joining us, John Stanky, who is the CEO of AT&T. John, thanks so much for taking the time out Absolutely. here. Absolutely. It's great to be here well, with you. we got to talk about how sports has really been a fixture in AT&T's growth strategy and the, the customer acquisition strategy over the years here. AT&T Stadium in Dallas, you've got the 5G innovation partnership with the NBA's Los Angeles Clippers, and then you've got over 20 years with the NCAA as a partnership there. When you think out to how critical sports is to this broader strategy for AT&T, why, why invest so much into that? And what is the, the return on that investment look like for you guys? Well, you know, it, first of all, it's something people are passionate about. So it's always good to be associated with something that people have passion for. And generally speaking, when you go to a game, you're in a good mood, you're receptive to hearing things. Sports is something that's part of the culture in the United States, so it's easy to activate. You know, you're seeing some of the things we're doing here where you can use our technology to enhance the fan experience. That's a natural place to go, and as a result of that, it's just good to get the brand in front of people and do that activation. And then, you know, there's some pretty big iconic figures that play in these sports uh, events that yeah. you imagine you, attaching yourself to it can be really good for your brand. Absolutely. You've got two NBA players in, in Shy and then as well uh, Paul George who have parted with AT&T. So amazing to see that. You know, one of the huge things that you mentioned just a moment ago, technology and the proliferation of technology being embedded within sports. and. I think about some of the conversations that have been taking place around AI and how that's made its way to the NBA arena as well. How does that show up in your business from the way that you, the C-suite, are talking about that? Is, is AI just going to supercharge the next smartphone life cycle, for instance? Well, I, you know, f f there's AI in sports and then there's AI broadly. And AI broadly, I mean, I personally believe this is as seminal as the founding of the internet for commercial purposes. I mean, if I think back in the 99, 2000 time frame, we said, what's the internet going to do to business and what's the internet going to do to how you reach customers? I don't think we had any imagination of what was actually going to transpire. I think AI is going to be another really significant seminal moment. And in our business, we have a lot of data in running our company. We have a lot of network information. We have a lot of information about our customers. If you can take generative AI and manage it with proprietary data sets, you can do some very powerful things. How we're going to engineer and design our network to adjust to traffic flows. What do we do to fine tune our customer service profiles to really match the particular need of a customer based on what we know on the behavioral patterns of what they're doing. These are all things that we're doing today and starting to engineer into the business. And then when you think about what we do broadly in society, when we're sitting in a arena, you start to imagine bringing in enhanced experiences, watching a basketball game. That's all payloads of data that have to be moved around that arena. And then if wireless is ultimately that user interface for that experience, it's going to be good for our business overall. What type of investment do you foresee AT&T really kind of leaning into this, this generative AI move that we've seen? Well, we've made significant investments right now. We're key partner with Microsoft, or one of their lead industry partners right at this time. It's a joint investment portfolio where we put in our time, our energy, our resources, our knowledge of business process. They've been furnishing compute for us to do that, to build the applications that they'll ultimately sell back into industry. But we're at the tens of millions of dollars a year right now, scale just within our business. The, the growth narrative, it's been challenged by some analysts out there who downgraded the stock in 2023, and they were looking at some of the wireless and broadband segment concerns. But at the same time, I mean, you reported Q4 earnings results, you beat on revenue, slight miss on earnings. What do you say to those out there who are, who are doubting this turnaround story up against some tough comps of the past too for AT&T? Look, I, I couldn't have been more pleased with the way 2023 went in total. We laid out for the financial community what we intended to do, and we not only did that, we beat it. Most importantly on cash, where we came in much stronger than, than what we had stated at the beginning of the year. And I think that's the ultimate sign of health in our company and in our industry. So I feel really good about how the business is operating. One of the reasons we were able to do that is the industry's healthy. And so I think there was some fear last year that people thought that the wireless industry was going to eat its young and that it wasn't healthy in how it was operating. And I would say quite the opposite. There's been record investment, new technology coming out, customers are using the product more, and those that invest in the technology are able to recover the cost of that investment. 
by getting value and pricing right. And I think that's been happening not only at AT&T, but with our competitors as well. What is your read on the economy right now? I mean, there's so many forecasts that come out around this time of year from CEOs who are looking through and getting their read on the consumer. What is the consumer telling you about the shape that the economy is in? The, the economy is resilient. I think it's been more resilient than many of us would have given it credit for maybe a year and a half ago. And I expect carrying through 24, we're going to see more of that. We're going to continue to see consumers spending. Um, we don't see any dynamics in our customer base that suggests credit is a problem. Uh, we still have people paying their bills the way they've normally paid their bills. We see growth in our core products and services and people willing to pay up for more value. That's all good things. And, and I think, frankly, the dynamics in the country moving into a presidential election cycle, policy is probably going to line up to make sure the economy stays on pretty even footing as a result of that as well. What, what type of election cycle are you anticipating? How does that change the fabric of how you do business right now in the broader telecom industry? I think the one I'm anticipating is I have no idea. And therefore, you have to anticipate every possible outcome and everything and just accept that it may take some twists and turns that are a traditional or different than what you might typically see and be ready to adjust to them. You have a Fed that could be cutting rates going into that election cycle and, and for consumers out there that, as you were talking about, the delinquency rates are at least alluding to it in, in some fashion, you know, for the consumer that's saying, I'm waiting for interest rate cuts because that's going to make me feel better. I mean, is that necessarily going to save them from the delinquency that they might already be in, or is it going to be such a sentiment turn for the consumer that it really elicits some type of different performance in the economy that we've seen to this point? I, I don't see it change because I think we're probably at peak rate right now, and I think things are pretty stable and healthy right now. I think based on last year's, last week's news, I don't see the Fed being disposed to a rate movement right this minute. It doesn't hurt my company. We're paying down debt. We're not out in the markets refinancing debt. We did a good job of structuring the balance sheet before rates went up and have very long-term structure around that and low interest rates. So frankly, for our business, I think we're fine. When the Fed starts to move, they're going to move. I don't know that it's going to have a dramatic change in sentiment in 2024 right now based on how things are structured. I want to end on a fun one because you guys have also really changed the fan experience for those who can't make it physically to some sporting events and games and matches with, with Holovision as well and some of the partnerships there. What is the next iteration of technology that is really just going to reinvent the fan experience from your perspective? Well, I, I think you're seeing it now. Vision Pro and what Apple is doing is another step in the augmented and virtual reality construct. Is that a hedge against like high ticket prices for consumers? No, I think it's both, right? I think there's going to be places where you want to go have that live experience and share it, but you can have a, even a richer experience at home that can have elements that will become more social and more interactive. And whether it's adding gaming and wagering into the experience while you're at home, if it's the social dynamic that occurs, when you're in the arena, there will be new uh, experiences that start to pop up as a result of that, that you know was talked about here at the session today. And these high performance networks that we're building are going to allow for that to happen. And it's augmented video that complements the play on the, on the court. These are all really exciting things that we're gonna see happen and they all drive more usage and more engagement with the networks that we build, and that should be a good thing for our business over the long haul. John, thanks so much for taking some time, sitting down with us. We know you've got a packed schedule of events this weekend. It's good to be here, and I'm glad that we could share a few minutes together. Absolutely, appreciate it. We'll be right back with more on Yahoo Finance.
The housing market narrative is shifting compared to last year, driving home builders to weigh the option of withdrawing incentives for buyers. Yahoo Finance's very own Danny Romero is here with the details. Danny. Josh, will this be the year that we say sayonara to those aggressive incentives like the mortgage rate buy downs, which is when the builder upfronts the cost to lower the rate on the loan? The answer is we'll see. Mortgage mm-hmm. rates are rising. So that's really squeezing the hope that a lot of people had that this spring selling season would be the turnaround story for the housing market. Now, the biggest home builders, Lennar, DR Horton, they have really signaled that they are not not going to pull back on incentives. And that is really their winning shot in this game get to gain the market share, which they've already been doing. Um, and for some perspective, DR Horton actually offers mortgage rates about one point below market rate. So that means you could gain a mortgage rate around 5%. And that's really attractive in this market. Uh, on the other hand, KB Home signaled that they are or will not be pulling back on incentives. But that is also before we had all this inflation data come out. Mm. So that also is part of this equation as well. Bottom line, builders are really looking at each other and trying to see who's gonna make Mm. the first move. Who's gonna blink first? Um, (laughs) Let's talk about housing starts, which we got today sliding in January. Mortgage rates, of course, ticking higher this week. So how does that fit into the narrative? I mean, we were looking for some relief. That doesn't feel like relief necessarily. Today's housing starts, the data that came out, really reflects the wintry weather, Mm. not necessarily the pullback in builder confidence. Remember, builders need good weather to build, and that does complicate the story in the winter months. So, um, and for some perspective, the biggest drop in housing starts was actually the regions that were hit by winter storms. So for example, in the Northeast, housing starts were down by 20% month over month. So that really does give you some perspective that certain regions were really hit by some of those storms. Uh, But looking ahead, economists are really expecting that single family starts will gain momentum. And the fact that the new home market is still looking like that really bright spot in this housing market, especially that these builders won't be like, uh, will continue to offer these incentives like those mortgage rate Mm. buy downs. I mean, 5% looks really Mm. great right now. Yes, it really does. Thank you so much, Danny. Appreciate it. Well, next time you're shopping for ice cream at your grocery store, the aisles might look a little different. Cooler Screens is using AI to transform the way shoppers see ads in stores. For more, let's welcome in the CEO, Arsene Avakian. Arsene, um, I guess my first question would be, why, for lack of a better question? In other words, you know, I, I don't think many people looked at their, you know, coolers in their grocery stores and thought, Man, I wish there were some ads there, but obviously you saw an opportunity there. What, how, how did that sort of come about? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, look, it's really not about the coolers or anything else. The, uh, the in-store marketing has been uh, left as the one of the last untouched areas for digitization. So technology inevitably is finding its way to bring the power uh, of digital into a physical world. And we started in the beverage aisle, but we uh, have implemented that across the whole store, giving uh, ability for shoppers and retailers and the brands to connect uh, in a way that actually is a lot more relevant and powered by the tech and AI behind it. And and when you digitize sort of the surfaces of the freezers, what, what is the benefit exactly to the consumer? So uh, the, the, uh, you think about this uh, through the lens of uh, uh, search engines or the, your Netflix TV at home. Uh, you want to see information that's relevant to you, right? You, your household sees the shows that, that are recommended to you, that make sense to you. Similarly, the search results that come up in your browser in a very similar fashion. Uh, shoppers have been accustomed to static analog digital uh, paper signage in, in their stores during their shopping. So. We built a technology that just like Google or Netflix uh, is understanding what people are interested in when they are shopping in a store and is providing a relevant content that is uh, dynamic and it's it's appealing and, and it helps hopefully people to find products that appeal to their either budget constraints or their dietary needs uh, or any other consideration that people have usually when they consider products in stores. Arsen, um, what kind of demand are you hearing about from the advertisers, from the companies here? I know you guys have a deal with Kraft Heinz. 
What about other big food companies? How are they seeing this? No, sure. We have uh, over 200 active advertisers on the platform. Uh, the, the the value is really uh, uh, nothing new that we're inventing. In-store marketing has been done for uh, uh, forever, right? All we did is we we saw the need that uh, bringing that analog marketing into the new age of digital will give the marketers the ability to understand uh, the performance of their uh, advertising buys. It will help them to uh, understand that the, those micro segments and those opportunities to uh, uh, to connect what I say intent with the content and drive the performance uh, that is incremental to their businesses. And Arson, what happens though? You're shopping, right? What happens if the item you see on the display isn't in the actual freezer? Well, so for the form factor you're referring to on the coolers and freezers, we've built a clever vision AI capability. So the, there are cameras on the back of the screens that are constantly scanning what products are on shelf and what, which ones are not. And as a result of that, we're always able to tell the shoppers what's in stock, what's out of stock. And, and that also informs uh, uh, the brands if they should be promoting or not. I mean, if, if I'm out of Diet Coke, uh, uh, I perhaps I can connect with the shopper and promote the regular or cherry Coke uh, and not let the competitor Pepsi take over, right, as an example. So uh, those are all different use cases, but uh, uh, Vision AI is uh, giving us a similar proxy, if you will, capability that websites obviously benefited on, on when you shop on Amazon or any website, you always know what's in stock, what's not, they were, they're not going to show you anything that's not available. Uh, and, and that capability is now coming to a physical environment. Arson, really interesting tech. Thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through it. Appreciate it. Of course. So to come on Yahoo Finance, as markets and Fed uncertainty rises, what should you do with your retirement savings? I'm going to give you the latest tips to better plan for your future later in the hour.
Time now to get an inside look at the world of high finance. Our next guest was once an assistant to a billionaire hedge fund manager and has now written a new book, Private Equity, that delves into the world of the 1% and the expectations that come with working in that world. Carrie Sun joins us now. Carrie, welcome to the show. And, and listen, congrats okay, on, the new, on the new book. Um, maybe to start, Carrie, you could just walk us through how you came to work uh, for this hedge fund billionaire, Carrie, and, and what kind of work were you doing? What exactly was the role? The role was the right-hand person to this hedge fund billionaire, and I was really in charge of managing his life. I provided him with both administrative support as well as research and operational, and I really just gave him um, hopefully extra time in his life to be able to do some higher return on time uh, activities. And, and it's so interesting to me, Carrie, the way that you put that, that hopefully you gave him some extra, I mean, clearly you still feel kindly to, towards this person, it seems. You wanted to do a good job at the same time that it sounds like the job kind of ground you into the ground, right? And it, it was exhausting. Um, so how did you come out of that experience and say, okay, this is a book, I wanna write about this, and what did you want to communicate through the book? I wanted to communicate through the book that we, by we, I, mean, I really actually do mean this grand we where I'm talking about myself, but cer certainly my boss in the book, um, are all kind of on this uh, treadmill of burnout and extreme intense work um, altogether because I do still feel kindly toward him. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, I think he valued me a lot. I did provide him, I think, with a, a lot of value. And he rewarded me by giving me raises, bonuses, and, and a lot of gifts. And in, in addition to that, I, he said some very kind words of praise toward me. And I think he really believed in my abilities. But at the same time, when I was driven to the ground with my burnout and I tried to speak up and ask him for help um, just in terms of possibly hiring uh, another person to assist me. Um, there was just not enough hours in the day to do the volume work that was required. And I asked him for help and he just wasn't able to get there for whatever reason. And so in my book, I'm trying to show how, you know, we tell ourselves these stories about who we are and what we believe about work. And I think the story that he might have told himself was that perhaps, uh, you know, like he was a kind giving boss. And he, I think he thought that he was pretty chill and easygoing and not that intense or required so much. And that he thought that my job was perhaps not so difficult. And when I told him about my burnout, I'm not sure that he actually really believed me. And Kara, I'm also interested, you um, you changed the name of, of the people and the firm that you work with. Why, why did you decide to do that, Carrie? I decided to do that because I really wanted to focus the story on my own story. I, I There are so, so many wonderful books written from the perspective of bosses and many of whom are billionaires and um, owners of these fantastic firms. But I, I really wanted to read a story set in that world, but from the perspective of an average worker. And I wanted to provide that story. I wanted to write what I wanted to read. And because I think um, I think there's room for voices in that world beyond those who call the shots. Um, Carrie, obviously you were close to extreme wealth um, working for this individual. What surprised you the most in terms of his lifestyle uh, while you were working for him? What surprised me the most was just how much work it took to make everything seem completely seamless. Um, I think, you know, on the surface, everything seems frictionless and glamorous, but I think underneath and behind the scenes, there are someone, and there are usually multiple people who uh, try to bring something, you know, to fruition and make it seem perfect and seamless and just, uh, there, there just are, you know, um, I'll give you an example. Just take one of his lunches, for example. His personal chef would uh, cook the lunch at his house, 
would hand deliver his lunch to me at the office. I would retrieve it. I would then look at his schedule, wait until it was the right time when he had five, 10 minutes to actually eat the lunch. Then I would go to the kitchen. I would follow the plating instructions, then plate the lunch, serve it to him. Then after he ate it, someone from the kitchen staff at the office would then have to wash the food storage glass containers, then usually his driver would drive those containers back at the end of the day and the whole cycle starts again. So in order to just eat his lunch, you know, multiple, like six people were involved with trying to make that happen. Amazing. Carrie son, that is an amazing little detail. Really appreciate your time today. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Well, activist investor Carl Icahn reportedly close to a deal to get two seats on the JetBlue Airways board. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. Icahn earlier this week unveiled a 10 percent stake in the airline. Um, and this uh, is really his first activist campaign since his own publicly traded arm, Icon Enterprises, came under fire from a short seller. By the way, also we should yeah. say happy birthday <laughs> to Mr. Icon. He is 88 yeah. today, even as he embarks on his umpteenth activist campaign. And clearly still working hard. Um, you know, it was interesting. So we knew we knew he had this stake. And in fact, you know, we, I think we heard about that on Monday. Mm -hmm. And you saw the cut in the stock really pop on that headline. Um, of course, you know, th this is what Carl Icahn does, right? He finds a target, he gets inside and starts rattling the cage for changes. I, it's not clear what specific changes Mr. Icahn wants here exactly. Um, we do know that JetBlue has issues to work out. You know, we talk, of course, the attempt to take over Spirit was blocked. Stock is down about 20% over the, over the past 12 months. So it'll be interesting to see what, what changes he wants to see at the airline. Yeah, I mean, and JetBlue is appealing that. JetBlue and Spirit are appealing that, but it doesn't seem like the, the prospects are very good. There's a new CEO um, who's just starting also at JetBlue, Joanna Garrity, who now, you And I know, believe the stake was revealed when she formally took the reins. Yeah, I think. so, yeah. you know, or was announced as, mm -hmm. as the person who was going to be taking the reins. So, you know, we'll see, to your point. It, it's very interesting. We've heard about a number of activist campaigns recently, not just by ICON, and, but we don't know what they want specifically. Mm. So hopefully um, we'll get more details as we learn about more about these board seats. And by the way, it means ICON is now the third largest shareholder. That's according to data compiled by Bloomberg. So big size stake. Yeah. Well, investors and analysts seemingly can't get enough over in, of NVIDIA over the past year. Next week, the Magnificent 7 stock will report its latest quarterly earnings. Let's take a deeper dive into what to watch from the tech giant. NVIDIA is Wall Street's AI darling. The company's stock price is a massive bull run, rocketing 380% since the end of 2022, and was the best performing component of the S&P 500 in 2023. With that said, here are three things we'll be watching for when the chip giant announces its fourth quarter earnings on February 21st. Artificial intelligence. NVIDIA is the tech industry's go-to provider for the powerful graphics processing units used to train and run generative AI models. Heck, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that his company will purchase an incredible 350,000 NVIDIA H100 cards by the end of 2024 at a price tag well into the billions of dollars. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tesla, you name it, every company is clamoring for NVIDIA's chips. And those are just the tech giants. Smaller firms are also working to get their mitts on NVIDIA's offerings. And with the earnings season already showing continued AI investment across the tech industry, NVIDIA stands to continue to gain considerably. Market expectations. Expectations for NVIDIA's fourth quarter are sky high after the company stunned Wall Street in the prior period when revenue rocketed an incredible 206% year over year to 18.12 billion. In the fourth quarter, the company is projecting revenue of 20 billion plus or minus 2%, well above analysts' prior expectations of 17.8 billion. And Wall Street doesn't see the growth stopping anytime soon. Bank of America recently raised its price target in NVIDIA from $700 to $800. Goldman Sachs also raised its price target for the company to $800. It previously had a price target of $625 on the stock. Regulation and competition. Still, it's not all smooth sailing for NVIDIA. The company is contending with U.S. export restrictions, blocking the sale of some of its high-end chips to China, one of its largest markets. And while that isn't hurting the company for now, it could mean the chip giant misses out on potential future sales. Then there are rivals. 
AMD and Intel are slowly but surely building out their own high-powered AI chips, with AMD in particular gaining on NVIDIA's tail. That company says its latest MI300X chip can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA's H100, a claim NVIDIA refuted via a blog post. Even NVIDIA's own customers, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla are building out their own AI chips, which could cut into the total addressable market for third-party AI chips. Still, those threats are relatively distant at this point. NVIDIA is still riding high at the moment, and we'll find out if it can keep the hype train rolling when it reports its results February 21st. Major indices snapping a five-week winning run after a string of hotter-than-expected economic data points fueled a roller coaster few days for the market. Unexpected strength in future readings could bring more market volatility in the weeks and months ahead. So what's the smart play for your retirement portfolio? Here with more Yahoo Finance's Carrie Hannon. Carrie, indeed, so a lot of the folks we've talked to have said we could see choppiness in the market going forward. Exactly. You know, and, and here's the thing, Julie. It's really... You know, the, the experts I've talked to are saying, you know, really no rash moves. This is all about fine tuning. For retirement investors, frankly, if you are automatically investing into your retirement account, you are already buying high, you're buying low. So it all over time, it evens out wherever you're getting in. So you're constantly investing. If you're invested in a target fund where it's tied to retirement date, you have a fund manager doing that for you. So it's balancing out of your, your equities and your in the bond holdings. So you have a balance in your investments. 
But here's what the bigger issue is, is that it's the run up in the stock market in the last year, right? I saw so many people opening up their, their balances, you know, in January going, oh my goodness, you know, it's been terrific. But here's the point is that's when you need to do that annual review. That's when, you know, you need to just take a look and say, am I close to what my asset allocation desirable asset allocation is, and that's the mix of stocks and bonds. It's going to be different for everybody. But if you're 7 to 10 percent off your original intention, then you got to do a little pairing back. And in this case, probably in your equity part. And, you know, the, the rule that uh, often people throw out is 110 minus your age is how much you should have in equities. Now, it's different for everybody, but that's just a way to think about it. The bigger issue here, too, so the big issue is the run-up. And how did that, the people who need to really be in a t pay attention to this right now is if you are in retirement or close to retirement, okay, let's take a little closer look at the equity portion of your portfolio. Because if you feel like you're going to be needing some liquidity to live on that, some of that for your, your costs moving forward, you're worried about the choppy markets, well, yeah, okay, let's take some of those profits and put them aside and some cash and some more liquid areas. Not a big deal, just a little pairing and taking some profits there. Again, I want to remind, remind everyone too, though, that, you know, investing in stocks is for the long term. But in today's world, for a retiree, you know, it is the long term investment you still need to be thinking about. So it's a part of everyone's portfolios. Carrie, thank you so much for the advice and guidance as always. Have a great weekend. You too. Time now for what to watch next week. It is a holiday shortened week with markets closed for the President's Day holiday. Another huge week, though, on the earnings front. NVIDIA, Walmart, Home Depot, Berkshire Hathaway, and Warner Brothers Discovery, they are all reporting earnings next week. All eyes, of course, will be on NVIDIA Wednesday after close, the last of the Magnificent Seven to report this earnings season. Stock is on a tear, up almost 50% to start the year. And ahead of that, Dow component Walmart is reporting Tuesday before the open, stock hitting an all-time high on Friday ahead of that announcement. Turning to the economy, a somewhat quiet week on the economic calendar. On Thursday, we will get the weekly reading on jobless claims and the January reading on existing home sales. On top of that, we'll get the monthly PMI report. Economists forecasting both services and manufacturing's PM PMIs will decline. And lastly, we'll have more commentary from Fed officials, as well as minutes from the January FOMC meeting. This coming after comments Friday from San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, saying that three rate cuts in 2024 is a, quote, reasonable baseline. Julie, what are you watching next week? Let's I'm hear. watching the same thing you're watching, man. The same thing everybody's watching. NVIDIA numbers. NVIDIA. Well, you know what? The problem is we didn't talk about enough this show. That's why I, <laughs> that's why I bring it up, Julie. We did a little extra. Reports Q4 results next Wednesday. Expectations, I think we can say they're off the charts. The stock's yeah. already up about 50% this year. It's up around 230% in the past 12 months. For the quarter, Street looking for revenue growth of 236%. And some of us think they can hit that bogey in part, they say, because they're kind of listening to the, the, co the company talk about improving supply. That's important. Right. And we've been talking about all of the bullish analyst commentary. Many, many analysts raising their price targets, including the one we highlighted from Loop Capital, putting it at $1,200. The thing I'm going to be curious sure. about, in addition to Jensen Huang, uh, you know, who really, I think you can safely say he's a visionary at this point, mm -hmm. speaking on the call, what is he going to have to say, though, about competition? We've talked about it a yeah. little bit in the show. There are some, you know, rumblings about some big money being put behind attempts to compete there. Is he going to address that? Is it still too early? It'll be interesting to see. All right, we'll be, we'll be listening and watching. We will. Reporting. And yes. All of those things. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great long weekend, everybody.